morning. Why don't we get started? Um, my name is Mara Carlin. I direct the Strategic Studies Department in the Merrill Center for Strategic Studies at Johns Hopkins SICE. I am delighted to welcome the extraordinary Dr. Mira Rapp Hooper today to talk about her fantastic new book, Shields of the Republic. We'll be discussing that title as well. Um, let me do some admin notes as we're getting started. Uh, so here on Zoom, as I suspect all of you know at this stage, we have this fantastic little Q&A feature. So please plug in your questions. And after I ask Dr. Rapp Hooper a handful of questions, uh, I'll turn to some of, some of yours as well. I should note that I'll be privileging questions from students in particular. So if you are a student uh, at SICE and you think that I might not know that, please make sure you put that in the question. Uh, really, really looking forward to that. And to be clear, questions have a question mark uh, and are not just a commentary. Um, I should also note that this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the SICE YouTube page later this week. So let me introduce Dr. Mira Rapp Hooper. She is currently the Stephen A. Schwartzman Senior Fellow for Asia Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. She's also a Senior uh, Fellow at Yale Law School's Paul Tsai China Center. And she thinks about all sorts of issues in her, uh, in, her, uh, in her work time. She thinks about issues like national security and strategy in Asia, great power competition, Washington's favorite catchphrase, of course, mm -hmm. alliances, nuclear issues, territorial disputes, what China's rise means for the international order and the future of American strategy toward Asia and China. She's done all sorts of interesting things before working at Council on Foreign Relations and Yale, like working at some fantastic think tanks such as the um, Center for a New American Security and the Center for Strategic and International Studies. So Dr. Rapp Hooper, I'm delighted to have you here today. Mara, it is great to see you. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks to the whole SICE team for their work to put on this event and to you all for joining us. Absolutely. Uh, so um, you wrote this fantastic book. It's brimming with rigorous analysis, lots of smooth writing. It's tremendously digestible, um, whether or not folks have a lot of, I think, experience in thinking through these issues. And in fact, what I, what I like in particular is the book kind of arms its readers with ammunition for how to think about these issues historically, how to think about them today and going forward. Uh, but first I have to ask you, why did you write a book? Writing a book is um, a somewhat miserable and difficult experience, some might say, uh, hopefully not just me. Uh, and, and so tell us what, what motivated you to, uh, you know, put uh, blood toil, tears and sweat a la Churchill into, um, into writing this. It's a great kickoff question, Mara. And the simple answer is that despite my better judgment, I felt like I had to write this book. Um, as we were sort of just discussing before we started this live conversation today, I had spent time as a PhD student working on alliances. I had written my dissertation on, in particular, the role of extended deterrence in US foreign policy. But after I graduated from my PhD, I set that project aside and I decided I was not going to publish it as a book. Um, but history and sort of contemporary events caught up to me by 2016 when of course the Republican nominee for the highest office in our fair Republic was on the campaign trail lambasting America's alliances as expensive and useless. Um, and it occurred to me that perhaps the most alarming part of these criticisms was the fact that they were not altogether unreasonable. That is for generations of Americans who had only known relative peace and prosperity, it probably was not all that clear why the United States had several dozen alliance commitments flung throughout Europe and Asia, much less the fact that these had been extraordinarily beneficial for the United States. But beyond that, there was an additional feature that made me feel like I had to write this book. And that is the fact that this difficulty in explaining alliances is actually a feature of their success. When alliances are working, we don't see them at all. Their success is measured by the wars that don't break out and the crises that don't escalate. So inadvertently, this system had buried its own record of success. Now, having worked on this topic as a PhD student, I knew that record was there. And I felt that the system would probably be in increasing jeopardy if it wasn't out in the world. So I set about to unearth it shortly after the election. 
Fantastic. That that makes a lot of sense. I especially appreciate your point on, on sort of the rumble in your belly about how you had to write it. Um, this is what I tell folks whenever they're pondering doing a PhD. You have to have a little bit of this unhealthy rumble in your belly to just get this thing out, whether or not um, whether or not it, it makes the most sense to do so. Um, you know, you, you started to walk to my next question. Your methodology is a little bit different than a lot of books we generally see, which is you use counterfactuals a whole bunch. Tell us a little bit about why you chose to do that. Yeah, so the answer is related uh, to the point I was just making. That is the idea that when alliances are working, we do not see them at all. So they inadvertently bury their own record. Um, and it's worth starting by just explaining briefly what a counterfactual is. Uh, a counterfactual is basically a thought experiment um, that is often used in social science and can be used in political science, um, where we basically try to hold most of the variables in the world constant in a given situation, changing just one of them to explore in more detail what the world would have looked like if that one thing had been different. Um, so because alliances and their success are so hard to measure, um, that is, it's impossible to run an alternative uh, world in which alliances didn't exist and know how that world would have differed from the one that we currently inhabit. I proceeded throughout my book by using a counterfactual thought experiment at the end of each chapter. And at the end of each chapter, I asked myself, what would have been different if we had not had alliances in this particular world? How would US foreign policy have changed? How would the world have looked different? And this is how I try to get at this really intractable problem of the difficulty of measuring alliance success. By varying just the alliance in the equation at each stage of the game, I'm able to get, I think, a little more specifically at what alliances have actually done and home in on what their power has been, as opposed to how we sort of understand correlations with them, um, but, but um, you know, don't always necessarily know definitively what their role has been. So again, the, the counterfactual thought experiment is an effort to get at this measurement problem. That makes a lot of sense methodologically. I think it also just makes your argument so much more accessible, right? To be able to say, hey, what, what if? Um, particularly for folks who don't obsess over these issues uh, every day. And I think, you know, to the, the point that we started out with, you know, why write the book, something that occurred to me is that the counterfactual was actually really evident for our grandparents' generation, right? Um, grandparents and great grandparents, anyone who lived through World War I or World War II, you did not really need to explain what the world looked like when the United States did not have a defense posture and a grand strategy that relied on alliances and forward defense. They had lived the alternative reality and it was horrifying. Um, but the more distant we become from that reality, the more it is actually necessary to think about these thought experiments and actually walk our population through the alternative, um, because otherwise it's very hard to appreciate what successful strategy has done. Yeah, it's a fantastic point. I mean, you know, we've got a situation now where for the last two decades, being in war has just become ambient noise for a lot of folks. And unlike those previous generation, actually very little to almost nothing has been asked um, of most Americans. Um, and, and so I think you're, you're sort of helping push a point and bringing it to life in a way that, that it really isn't, I think, um, for various generations at this stage. That makes sense. So let's turn to the history for a moment. Um, you make this argument that the decision to form alliances was this big strategic change for the United States. Tell us a little bit about why you saw this U-turn, if you will, after World War II, and then how well did it work out, especially throughout the Cold War? Yeah, so the, the basic explanation for why this U-turn happened um, was how the United States defined its own self-defense. That is, for the first 150 years of the Republic, the United States decided that its self-defense required it never to form an alliance with any country. And after that, it decided that it could not keep itself safe without them. Between the Revolutionary War and World War II, the United States explicitly abjured the formation of any standing alliance in foreign policy as an almost doctrinal matter. Um, George Washington had sort of made a remonstrance in his farewell address in which he warned against alliances. And his predecessors may have actually taken the warning a little bit too far. Uh, Washington was peeved at the moment about the United States alliance with France, which had helped it to win the Revolutionary War. But as a result of his warnings, no US president would consider forming an alliance um, for the next 150 years. So much so was this um, sort of theology in American foreign policy that Woodrow Wilson had to create 
a false or, or a sort of an invented category to allow the United States to enter World War I without formally declaring itself a part of an alliance. Um, but by World War II, this position was simply no longer tenable. Um, the war itself exposed the fact that changes in geography, or rather changes in technology, had overtaken the United States' advantageous geography. The advent of long-range bombers, uh, the beginnings of the Missile Age, and of course the dawn of the nuclear age, meant that the United States could no longer be safe behind two ocean barriers and with friendly neighbors on its borders. So it adopted a completely novel strategy. For centuries, countries had used alliances to try to fight and win specific wars. Uh, but the United States gamble was that it was going to try to use alliances to keep wars from starting at all. The aim was to hold the balance of power in both Europe and Asia, using alliances for three interrelated objectives. First, the United States would use alliances to establish forward defense. That is the forward deployment of troops and bases overseas to meet threats farther from home rather than allowing them to land on American shores. Second, and relatedly, it would seek to deter conflicts from starting at all. That is, dissuade rivals from ever attacking the United States or one of its allies. And third, it would use alliances to assure allies and to exert some amount of control over them um, to keep them on sides with preferred US foreign policies. This was, as it probably sounds like, an incredibly ambitious plan, and it paid off, frankly, better than its architects ever could have imagined. Of course, the Cold War stayed cold. Um, no US ally was ever the victim of an attack causing the United States to come to its aid, which frankly was not at all foreseeable at the point that the system was formed. Cold War hotspots that seemed all too likely to escalate, whether we're talking about divided Germany and Europe, the Korean Peninsula, or the Taiwan Straits, stayed relatively peaceful. Uh, the United States helped to stem the spread of nuclear weapons using its alliances. It helped to transform former wartime rivals like Germany and Japan into close partners, consolidated democracies and economic powerhouses in their own right. And the United States bought itself a tremendous amount of political goodwill with this security system that ultimately made its preferred foreign policies far cheaper and more effective than they ever could have been otherwise. Absolutely. That, that makes a lot of sense. So then the Cold War ends, of course, right? Um, talk to us a little bit about what's been happening since then. Uh, how you think about what the Russians have been doing, the Chinese have been doing, kind of why you see those as problematic. And in particular, I'm curious to hear how, kind of what, what's the, 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 the sort of moment in time that you start to say, hey, something's going on. I noticed in the book, you sort of, you, you talk about 2012 um, in particular, and that struck me uh, because sitting in the Pentagon working on the defense strategy just a year after that, we all could tell something was going on, right? We're watching East China Sea, South China Sea, of course, then you get Crimea a little bit later. Um, and and there, it was clear there was some sort of power shift, some sort of efforts to kind of stress test the system, but it was really hard to, to understand and to diagnose at that moment. So cur curious to kind of hear your thoughts on what you think the Russians and Chinese were doing and, uh, and, and where you're pinpointing uh, uh, sort of what, what this all kind of comes to a head. Yeah, it's a fantastic question, Mara, and I'm really eager to dig into the second part of it with you, which is to say um, when this pivot point happens and how we recognize it. So I'm going to take the first part of the question first, and then we'll dig into the second part together. Um, so the first part of the question, that is, what, it, what happens at the end of the Cold War um, to the U.S. alliance system, and then what do Russia and China do next? Of course, the Soviet Union collapses and collapses peacefully which was exactly the sort of triumph that this alliance system was intended to bring about. In fact, it is the triumph in my subtitle, right? The fact that the Soviet Union willfully dismantles itself without shots being fired. Um, but without a great power adversary in either Europe or Asia, the US alliance system really goes adrift for at least about a decade um, after the end of the Cold War. Um, in Europe, NATO is, of course, focused on enlargement, that is expanding its membership. Uh, the U.S. alliance system in Asia has far less direction. Um, but centrally, neither one of these projects is focused on the defense and deterrence of the alliance against Russia or China. They are focused on more intra-alliance issues um, and kind of, you know, Cold War peace, post-Cold War peace dividends. Mm -hmm. And this period inadvertently creates some weaknesses in the alliance system that adversaries will eventually exploit. Um, by the turn of the 21st century, you see both Russia and China in very different ways 
establishing two-pronged strategies on the conventional and even nuclear uh, military levels both of these re-emerging rivals are crafting military strategies that seek to demonstrate that the United States may not be able to credibly defend its allies in a military conflict with either Russia or China. In China's case, this means its development of anti-access area denial capabilities and approaches, which seek to raise the risk to the United States of entering a conflict in the Western Pacific on, half of, on behalf of an ally like Japan or Taiwan. Um, so potentially just showing that the United States will not be there uh, for them in wartime. Likewise, in Europe, Russia is increasingly developing a strategy that aims to show that it could cleave off a piece of NATO's eastern flank before the United States and Western European countries get there in time to stop it. Um, so kind of creating a credibility problem on the military level in both alliances. But each of Moscow and Beijing are also developing very different strategies, which I term in the book competitive coercion. We could call them gray zone strategies um, for the sake of simplicity. But they are advancing their aims below the military threshold in ways that route around the American alliance system and actually never trigger it at all. So in China's case, we could think about things like its use of cyber attacks or its island building campaign in the South China Sea. In Russia's case, of course, we can think about things like uh, election interference in both the United States and in Europe. Um, but basically, both of these rivals find ways to advance their interests in their immediate regions without ever triggering backlash or countervailing pressure from the United States and its alliance system. And that is in part a result of the fact that American alliances are designed to operate almost exclusively at the military level. So by this sort of 2008 timeframe, we start to get the murmurings of a picture in which Russia and China have really changed tack um, and which they're clearly advancing on multiple fronts in ways that incre increasingly hamstring American alliances. Absolutely. No, I, I really appreciate the way the way that you're talking about that, and that that actually, it seems to me the fact that China and Russia end up uh, taking this kind of competitive, coercive approach or gray zone appro approach, as various folks have discussed it, is 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 actually a sign that things are working pretty well, um, because they know that if they go too high, it'll immediately trigger uh, trigger yeah. some sort of response. So there's goodness for them in not doing it, but it seems to me that that's a reason for countries like the United States to also take a two-pronged approach, to recognize you need to be involved at the higher end and you need to be involved at the lower end, if you will. Exactly. And this sort of brings us to the question uh, that you raised, Mara, the second part of your question, which is why did they have the sort of time and space to advance in this way? Like, when did alarm bells start going off? When did we recognize what Russia and China were doing? Um, and I think it bears just repeating what you just said, which is that the fact that both Moscow and Beijing moved into this competitive, coercive space is really a product of alliance success. That is, it's a product of functional deterrence that both Russia and China recognize that if they attack Japan or if they overtly attacked an American ally in Europe, they were going to be met with a reprisal. And as a result, they crafted strategies that were far more subtle and slippery and therefore harder to respond to, um, but still nonetheless uh, presented real problems for American and allied interests. So then the question of when did we realize this and why did it maybe take us a little bit longer than one might have expected? I think the sort of conventional answer, which has some truth to it, is of course for um, the, at least the first decade of the 21st century, really the first two, the United States was bogged down in wars in the Middle East, um, which took up a significant amount of national security bandwidth. And of course we can walk and chew gum, but even at the beginning of the Obama administration and indeed throughout it, we were very much focused on those conflicts and where and how to draw down from them. But that is only a small part of the story. Um, the second thing I would note is that although Russia and China did become a little bit more prickly and assertive around the 2008 period, it was not at all evident at that time that this was a truly strategic turn for either one of them. That is, after the global financial crisis, it is now clear uh, that strategists in both Moscow and Beijing thought the United States was on the decline that its model had sort of been blown open and this was a moment of opportunity for both of them to begin to advance. And while we do begin to see uh, some early assertiveness from both countries in that period, Russia, of course, invading Georgia in 2008, or China becoming increasingly assertive in the East China Sea and South China Sea in 2008 and 2009, 
Both countries were also engaged in fits and starts cooperation with the United States during that same period. We'll recall there was a reset with Russia. They signed the New START Treaty. Um, both countries were involved in some major global initiatives that were big priorities for the United States, namely the Iran nuclear deal and the Paris Climate Accord. Um, mm -hmm. So it was possible to look at their behavior on the global level and say, okay, this is not a completely unalloyed competitive picture here, that Russia and China are cooperating on some items that are really important to us. But the third thing I would note is that these strategies are expressly designed to elude. That is the entire point of Russian and Chinese strategy during this 2008 to 2012 period was it would be increasingly difficult for the United States to identify what either country was doing. Um, that is, even when China started building islands in the South China Sea, there was no reason to immediately understand that those would result in seven bristling military bases. Finally, I'll make a sort of geeky wonkish point here, Mara, which I feel compelled to make because I'm talking to you and you'll tell me whether I'm right or wrong about this. That sparks but, joy. Okay, great. Um, as a matter of process, when a country like Russia or like China is using coercion as opposed to outright military force, it also tends to slip between the bureaucratic cracks of US foreign policy, right? So we have offices at the Pentagon, clearly, Mara, you ran one of them, that are set up to monitor and craft rejoinders to developments in high-end conventional military competition. But when China is using law enforcement vessels or commercial dredging technology to change the status quo in the South China Sea, it's less clear whose remit that is, much less what the rejoinder should be. Um, so even once the United States started to see a picture in which both Russia and China seemed to be advancing in these really idiosyncratic ways, it was harder to respond than it should have been. And this was expressly by design. Um, so that gets us to a picture where I basically think this 2008 to 2012 period was a transition in both Russian and Chinese foreign policy. It took a few years after that for the United States to recognize that both were really reviving themselves in their region. And now here we are um, at a point where great power competition is perhaps even more common parlance than it should be in Washington. Um, obviously, sometimes received problematically overseas, but nonetheless is describing a real challenge for U.S. foreign policy. Absolutely. It, um, as you're speaking, it reminds me a lot of Roberta Wolstetter's idea of signals and noise. Mm -hmm. um, I think the during the 08 to 12 period, as Beijing and Moscow are kind of reconceptualizing what their strategy is, you see you see challenges within the U.S. because there's so much noise that it's hard to figure out where are these brief signals, and then obviously you have you know the economy melting. You then have ISIS uh, emerging, and so it, it becomes a, your process answer is a superb one. Also, um, you know, it, it's it's hard to be the folks kind of saying, "Hey, there's something going on here." When the news of each day is sort of dragging uh, dragging down the focus, and it's really hard to shift your resources and investments uh, in in that same vein. Absolutely, uh, I think that that makes a lot lot of lot of sense. Um, let me ask you, say, two more questions uh, or so, and then I'll I'll turn to some of the great questions we have in the Q and A. So, um, y'all, uh, particularly students, please please feel free to populate those. Um, I want to talk to you about your prescriptions. Uh, you you know you you sort of outlined why we should care and why this ma why this matters in this really really thoughtful way, and outline why this is increasingly worrisome. These efforts to target. The U.S. Uh, uh, alliance system, which is which is this uh, kind of unparalleled network, um, and so you've got these prescriptions, things like needing to reinforce Asia's China sense, the need to hold the line while Russia declines, and in particular, what struck me is the importance of narrative, and uh, and so almost like story storytelling, if you will. Uh, tell us a little bit about your 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 prescriptions and and how to kind of bring them bring them to life. Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. The, the bottom line with my prescriptions really is that America's alliances need to change if they are to be saved. Um, not only is the current president an obvious antagonist to the system, but stasis is also an antagonist to the system. That is to say, if Trump is, you know, run out of office uh, in November um, and we have a President Biden, simply keeping the American alliance system the same will not be enough to save it, precisely because of these challenges from Russia and China that we've been discussing and major shifts in relative geopolitical power, which have transformed the international order irreparably. So then the question is, how do we change this system to save it? My answer is that 
we broaden America's alliances to increase both the scope of what they include and the scope of contributions that our allies can make. So first, why do we increase the scope of what they can include? As we've just been discussing, the nature of competition in the 21st century has shifted. Of course, it is still the case that Russia poses a military challenge to Europe and China a military challenge to Asia. But it's very likely that most of the forms of competition we'll see in the 21st century will be non-military. So America's pacts are going to have to move into these spaces to meet some of these challenges. And that can happen in at least two ways. First, America's alliances can be broadened by expanding the scope of what these treaty guarantees actually can include. The United States and its allies should seriously consider applying these alliance treaties to certain types of non-military attacks. For example, cyber attacks on critical infrastructure or state-backed election interference campaigns. Assaults whose effects are so grievous and so jeopardize the political independence of the states who are their victims as to rise to the level of military attacks. So these are things we might usefully include inside our treaty guarantees. But beyond that, we should increasingly be using our alliances to coordinate for a whole broader range of threats that we can't necessarily deter in advance. I'm thinking there of standing channels to examine the national security implications of new technology, for example, such as China's 5G networks, or even to prepare for better supply chain security should we face another global health crisis. All areas that don't fall inside our traditional alliance domain and yet are increasingly going to be how we define our security in the 21st century. And the benefit to broadening our alliances this way is it actually gives our allies the opportunity to do a lot more. Of course, we've heard a lot about burden sharing and allies needing to spend more for their security in the last few years. Often it's difficult for them to boost their defense budgets too much because they have domestic political constraints against doing so. But if our alliances increasingly include activities that come from foreign ministries and intelligence communities, it's actually easier for our allies to spend more and to do more in ways that are politically feasible for them. So by broadening our alliances, we'll not only meet the types of competition we're actually likely to face in the 21st century, we'll make them more balanced in terms of responsibilities and financial commitments in ways that may actually allow them to persist for decades more. Now, when it comes to the question of narrative, um, I do have a section of my conclusion about how we sort of reshape our alliance narrative. But the real short answer I'd give here, Mara, is that I'd like to see us sort of set to the side nostalgic narratives about alliances. We too often hear policymakers venerating our alliances as though they're sort of objects on the mantelpiece to be appreciated for their history and shared values. The clear way we should be framing this narrative is that alliances need to be saved because they work. They have worked remarkably well at the tasks that were set out for them for the first many decades of their life, and they can keep working so long as we make the changes required for them to survive. And the reason to do this is that American security and prosperity will be far costlier in blood and treasure than they could possibly be with them if we allow the system to collapse. So I'd like to see this narrative be an increasingly pragmatic one focused on the present and future instead of the past and clear eyed about what the system has already achieved. That's fantastic. Uh, yeah, the, the, the idea of being careful of the nostalgia because the citations just, just don't resonate in the same way. Um, let me ask you one more question and then I will turn to some of the great Q&A that we have from, from, uh, from folks so far. Uh, your title. Talk us through your title, because it is not wholly original, which I find really interesting. Tell us about it. it. Yeah, it's not wholly original. Shields of the Republic, which is my primary title, is the appropriation of a subtitle uh, that belongs to Walter Lippmann, the mid-century journalist and commentator. Walter Lippmann wrote a book in 1943 uh, called U.S. Foreign Policy, colon, Shield of the Republic. And I uh, appropriated Lippmann's subtitle for my title because I thought that his book spoke to two main arguments that were central to why America's alliances have been invaluable to US national security. First, Walter Lippmann in his book argued uh, that US foreign policy is intended primarily to keep the Republic safe 
um, so that the Republic can progress and prosper, that it is, it is the shield of the Republic. And this is exactly the role that alliances have played in American foreign policy. They have allowed the United States to stay safe um, at a reasonable cost and allowed its democracy to progress over the course of the last several decades. But another really important point that Lippmann makes in this book, which he wrote at the height of World War II, is that US foreign policy has to be strategically solvent. That is, its objectives must be matched with the means at their disposal. And if those two things come out of line, a country will be unable to sustain its foreign policy one way or the other. Alliances are a huge part of the reason the United States has been able to sustain an incredibly ambitious foreign policy since the end of World War II. And that's not to say that this foreign policy should remain the same. It cannot. Uh, but when it comes to a question as we face now in contemporary geopolitics about how the United States is going to maintain an international leadership role, particularly alongside a rising China um, and an increasing set of geopolitical constraints, the answer must be a foreign policy that is strategically solvent. And as a result, I think Littman still has a lot to tell us about both why this alliance system is a success and how we can continue to use its lessons on the road ahead. I have pluralized his subtitle to make it Shields of the Republic um, in a nod to the fact that the United States has had many different approaches to alliances already over the course of the life of the Republic and that these shields will need to change again if they are to survive. Absolutely. Uh, great. Um, so we have a lot of good questions. Uh, let me start with one by a China Studies student, Emma Schleifer, who wants you to tell us about China's approach to alliances. How should we think about it now and going forward? That's a great question. Uh, China traditionally does not have formal treaty allies in the way that the United States does, and I do not expect that it will anytime soon. However, it does object vociferously to the U.S. alliance system in Asia, and so I'll take that um, in a couple of different parts. First, um, China does not have traditional treaty allies. Um, on the books, it still has one remaining treaty alliance uh, with North Korea, not who any of us would pick as our single ally if we had to pick one. Um, and it did formerly have an alliance uh, with the Soviet Union, uh, which the two countries abrogated after a longstanding dispute between them. But even when it had these treaties on the books, China's alliances did not look like those of the United States. Um, there were no public pledges to come to each other's aid under a certain set of circumstances. Um, there was a strong alignment there, but it was a fundamentally different type of relationship than what the United States has constructed in its system. And during the Cold War, China was actually reasonably okay with the American alliance system in Asia. That is, it would have strictly preferred to see less by way of an American troop presence there, but it also understood that Washington's presence meant that countries like South Korea and Japan were not pursuing nuclear weapons or other potentially destabilizing capabilities when they might have been. So for a very long time, China actually accommodated itself to the presence of American alliances in Asia. Particularly since the end of the Cold War, however, China has objected to the US presence in Asia and the American alliance system, calling it a product of Cold War thinking and increasingly concerned that these alliances are encircling China. Now, this is actually a concern that I entertain a bit in my book, and I have simply never seen evidence for the idea that American alliances have actually led China to make self-defensive moves that it wouldn't have made otherwise. What I mean by that is the fact that during the 1990s, U.S. alliances were not focused on China. They were actually really distracted and focused on other things. And it was during that same period that China developed the strategies that we've been talking about here. Um, so far from seeing good evidence that America's alliances have antagonized China, um, I think the opposite is true. To the extent that they've now become more focused on Beijing, that's a product of Beijing's uh, uh, actions first and foremost. Finally, going out into the future, I see very little likelihood that China will create foreign treaty alliances with any country, even as its influence grows. Uh, rather, I think we'll probably see it using something like its Belt and Road type of model as the way that it projects its power. 
offer. Um, a system of flexible bilateral arrangements that are mostly dependent on commerce and technology as opposed to a more set of traditional treaty arrangements. This has a lot of benefits for Beijing. It has some liabilities, including the fact that it probably will never have an overseas basing system that looks like that of the United States. Uh, but it's a much more faithful approach to the way that China sees its own foreign policy than the type of security system that the United States has architected. That's really helpful and, and allows us to avoid mirror imaging. Um, you've got a couple questions on the U.S. alliance with South Korea. So Seung Kim from Voice of America wants to get your assessment of the current state of the U.S. ROC alliance um, and, and how to think about it. And then uh, we've also got Jessica Gott, who's out at U.S. Forces Korea, who wants to get your thoughts on how this alliance should transition given the whole U.S.-China great power competition. Yeah, two fabulous questions. Um, and I think it is safe to say that the state of the US ROK alliance is not nearly as strong as it should be right now. In fact, it is uh, in disarray in ways that belie geopolitics and that international relations should tell us is nearly impossible. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. Um, first, North Korea. Um, is the clear central threat against which the U.S.-South Korea alliance is designed to deter and defend. Um, traditionally, the American alliance system in Asia uh, has been made up of separate bilateral pacts, unlike in Europe where we have one cohesive multilateral NATO alliance. And part of the reason for this was that in the early days of the Cold War, American allies in Asia all had different primary adversaries. South Korea was primarily concerned with North Korea because it had just been invaded by it. So the South Korean alliance has been focused almost exclusively on North Korea for a very long time, although China has emerged as part of the picture. The reason why the disarray should strike us as so mind-boggling right now is the fact that North Korea has never been more dangerous. Of course, North Korea acquired an intercontinental ballistic missile in 2017, which potentially gives it the ability to strike the U.S. homeland with a nuclear weapon should it, use to do, should it wish to do so. And under the cover of diplomacy for the last several years, it's continued to roll nuclear weapons off of the production line um, and now has a reliable and deliverable nuclear weapons capability. Under any law of geopolitics, we would think that these threat conditions should make the US ROK alliance stronger than ever because it had been strong for many years. But unfortunately, the approach of the current administration has been to prioritize spending shakedowns over any national security concern. Um, the US and the ROK are currently deadlocked in a spending disagreement um, that is the product of a demand by the United States for South Korea to quintuple its spending uh, towards alliance costs. And while the South Koreans have been willing to increase their costs substantially, and they were already generous before this, they are not going to be able to get to this quintupling goal, which raises the question of whether the demand may be a pretext to try to draw down troops from South Korea um, because the South Koreans will never be able to meet this objective. That, of course, would be hugely destructive to the alliance at a point um, when we need to be more focused on developing new strategies to deter and defend against an increasingly dangerous North Korea, but also to bring in the second great question to think about the role that China plays um, in South Korean defense. South Korea will never be Japan or even Australia um, in the way that it thinks about China's role. It will remain primarily focused on North Korea. But so long as the United States gives Seoul the room to have its close commercial and economic ties with China, it can increasingly have productive conversations about what it means to keep Asia safe and secure as China continues to rise. A key part of bringing out that part of the conversation will be helping Seoul and Tokyo to rebuild their relationship, which has really suffered these last few years. Um, but over time, I do think it will be possible to increasingly build in a broader lens to this historically successful alliance such that it can think about China. That said, we're gonna have to make it past the spending standoff for it to do so, because if the United States were to break its alliance with South Korea over an unreasonable spending demand, it would be so much worse off in a world in which North Korea is increasingly threatening and China is an increasing concern for every country in the region. So I think what we're hearing from you is that we should be careful of obsessing over dollars 
uh, particularly when, when we've got generous allies. Um, huh? <laughs> let's keep walking around Asia since you've got a lot of questions on that specifically. Uh, ben Lee, one of the current students, wants to know about the Philippines. How do we think about that alliance, especially given the sporty personality that is Duterte? It's a great question. Um, Duterte presents a huge challenge to U.S. foreign policy and the U.S. position in Asia. And I think the way that this alliance has been managed for the past several years has actually been more or less the right approach. Um, that is, the, the approach has been to try to handle Duterte himself with kid gloves, um, to try not to provoke him excessively, and ultimately to try to wait him out. Um, Duterte, while a total populist firebrand and deeply distressing in his form of leadership, which involves rampant extrajudicial killings in the Philippines, does not represent the national security consensus in the Philippines whatsoever. That is, while Duterte has been willing to hold at risk the U.S. alliance to court investment from China, um, the foreign policy professionals who make up the Philippines Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Ministry of Defense are wildly uh, in favor of the alliance with the United States, want to stick by their territorial and maritime claims in the South China Sea, um, and broadly see themselves as more consistent with the approaches of the prior president of the Philippines. This is really important um, because without the Philippines, the United States does not have an adequate forward defense position in Southeast Asia. Um, after the end of the Vietnam War, the United States really deprioritized um, its footing in Southeast Asia. And of course, after the end of the Cold War, the United States was actually ejected from its two major bases in the Philippines. Only under the Obama administration through um, the Ed Ed Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement, EDCA, did the United States reacquire rotational positions in the Philippines that could theoretically allow it to help defend the Philippines and the South China Sea against a prospective conflict or crisis with China. If the Philippines ultimately ejects the United States from these positions, as Duterte has threatened to do, the United States will have a much harder time claiming any credible defense of that particular part of the region. But luckily, uh, the working level in both Washington and Manila has managed to keep this relationship more or less on track. A few months ago, Duterte was prepared to kick the United States out once again and end the visiting forces agreement, um, but has decided to actually withdraw that termination of the agreement for now. Uh, so what we should hope ultimately is that these folks, civil servants on the working level, keep their heads down, keep the alliance on a reasonably steady, if low profile course, and that the Philippines elects a new leader that is more in line um, with the uh, national security priorities that uh, most of the Philippines people and uh, as well as uh, bureaucrats and experts represent. Absolutely. So what we're hearing from you really is, is technocratic relations matter a lot and, uh, and, and keep kind of the machinery going, even when there might be uh, sporty leaders. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, I, su I suspect um, there may be some countries thinking that uh, right now of, of Washington, perhaps. No kidding. Um, let's do one more question that's Asia specific. It's one near and dear to my heart uh, since my one of my first jobs in government was working on the, uh, the US-India relationship and how to transform mm -hmm. it early in the aughts. So we have a student, uh, journalism student at Delhi University in India, Ayan Kartik, who wants to know, where do you see the US-India relationship going forward? Uh, particularly referencing, of course, what we've been seeing is these border clashes between India and China. What, what's the thinking there? And, uh, and I might push this question a little bit further. What's actually the art of the possible? Um, this may be bringing my, my own kind of scars from this topic, but uh, there were grandiose ambitions uh, for, for what could occur here. And uh, curious to hear whether or not you think those can ever be fulfilled. Absolutely. Um, and I'd love to hear from you on this, Mara, before we take the next question. Um, I think what you're alluding to is the fact that on a bipartisan basis, really, um, and I would say primarily since the George W. Bush administration, there has been an increasing hope amongst the U.S. national security community that Washington would be able to cultivate its relationship with Delhi to really bring India out as a regional counterweight to China. Um, and I think that while there are things about this relationship that are really important and aspects of that thinking that should remain, it's also important to be really modest and fairly humble in our expectations about what India is very likely to do. 
That is to say that there is no question that China sees, or rather India sees China's role increasingly as prospectively threatening to it um, and is interested in thinking about how to better defend itself but it is not interested in being pulled into Asia writ large as the United States newest buddy on the block, um, ready to go toe to toe with Beijing at every turn. Um, India is primarily concerned um, in the maritime space with its immediate Indian Ocean region. And of course, um, by way of land power with respect to these uh, border conflicts that we've just seen bubbling up with Beijing uh, in the last couple of months. Uh, but I think the hope that India is going to take on status of a quasi ally is wildly overstated. Uh, US foreign policy should continue to try to engage India in uh, ongoing dialogues such as the quadrilateral security dialogue with Australia and Japan. It should try to continue uh, quiet defense cooperation where it's possible, but should also recognize that India has a long and venerable tradition of a non-aligned foreign policy. Um, and it's likely to try to keep up that tradition. So the hope should be modest and incremental improvements um, in what we are doing in our activities and in our consultations with India, but not looking at India to save the day and reshape the chessboard in Asia. Yes, I could not agree more. Um, just, just look, uh, the U.S. needs to be, I think, sober and clear-eyed about what's possible. It does still make sense to invest in this relationship, Absolutely. right? A, a more involved India is generally going to be a good thing. Uh, but my goodness, uh, even even getting it beyond uh, their their geography specifically is really, really hard. Obviously, outside of places like Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bangladesh, where the, where they're more comfortable, um, let alone. Um, more, more dramatically across Asia or, or globally. I think we're just, we're not seeing that. We're not going to see that. And, uh, and I think U.S. expectations, particularly in the first decade or so of this relationship after, after kind of the, the, the big bang of transforming it in, um, in summer 05 or so, uh, one just, one needs to be sober um, and, and tempered expectations. So I'm, I'm in violent agreement with you on Absolutely. that. Absolutely. I'll add one quick note about the border war, right? The, the border clashes between China and India are a really big deal. Um, this is China's first use of force abroad in 30 years. These border conflicts had stayed peaceful for decades. And while Delhi was increasingly concerned about China's role in the region, the loss of a few dozen Indian soldiers is a big deal for a government that has really stoked nationalism. That is, it's not going to be able to transform public opinion back, put it back in a box and pretend that this border conflict didn't happen. That said, it also doesn't mean that India is now going to sort of tack towards close alignment or alliance with the United States. That is, even if India is increasingly wary of China, which it will be, it's had its eyes open to these prospective threats for the last many years. Um, so I think we're, what we're likely to see is India doubling down on being India um, after these clashes, as opposed to completely transforming in a direction that might wildly benefit the balance of power as the United States sees it. That is a perfect description, uh, indeed. Um, let's actually do one more one more question on Asia before we turn to Europe. Uh, Richard Cohn wants to get your thoughts on the U.S. alliance with Japan. Um, uh, Japanese, uh, the self-defense forces policy is is changing, obviously, in recent years. Talk to us a little bit about where where you see this going. So the U.S. alliance with Japan has traditionally been our most steadfast in Asia. That is, if you think of the hub and spoke system in Asia comprising several different American allies, all of whom uh, you want to stay U.S. treaty partners, but also sort of hedge in their relationships with China. Japan is the one who is most closely sort of tied to the mast, going down with the American national security ship, like be damned, right? But even in this alliance, we have seen a remarkable amount of hedging over the last few years. Um, that is in just the last couple of years, um, in particular during the trade war between the United States and China, we saw Tokyo increasingly courting improved relations, not just on an economic front, um, but more broadly with China as a hedge against US unpredictability. Um, and as you're also referring to, I think we have of course seen a transformation in Japanese defense policy. Transformation is probably overstated. Um, a major set of changes in Japanese defense policy in the last few years um, that increasingly uh, make Japan willing to think about its own self-defense in ways that it wasn't before. Part of this is a product of the Abe government and the extreme muscle he has 
uh, put behind reinterpreting Article 9 of Japan's constitution. But part of this is a product of a change threat environment coupled with increasing concerns about the dependability of the United States. So you have seen Japan revise some doctrine, um, deploy missiles to the Southwest Island chain to prospectively try to mount its own defense um, against China should there be some sort of fracas over the Senkakus. Um, and I do think there is a bit of momentum behind those types of thinking in Japan now. However, there's a big open question about how much of this will outlast Abe. Um, so if the United States does elect new leadership um, in a few months, I think a critical question is what is the set of priorities that the United States wants to take with respect to Japan? It should try to harness this momentum um, in Japan's desire to provide for its own self-defense. It should be working in lockstep with its Japanese allies to figure out how the two together are going to mount a credible defense of uh, the first island chain in the Western Pacific, that is the string of archipelagos that swings through Asia. Um, but we should also recognize that a lot of these changes are contingent on both politics in Japan and politics in the United States, and that we really can't take this relationship or any of the alliances in Asia for granted. That's really sobering. Uh, let's jump to Europe for a moment. Uh, current Strategic Studies student Emma Vitale wants to hear your thoughts on NATO. How should it evolve uh, as we're going forward? Great question. Um, and the answer is manifold. Um, NATO has at least three sets of challenges on its hands as I see them and probably more depending on how we want to define them. Um, and it bears noting that of course the current crisis that we're living through now is incredibly difficult for every ally and every alliance, um, which is to say that even for the countries that have fared relatively better, like Germany or South Korea, um, this crisis is going to cause many countries to focus inward, to grapple with economic and health recovery for a very long time. So keeping alliance agendas on track in spite of this is going to be no small feat. Um, and I recognize that at the outset before laying out an incredibly ambitious agenda for NATO. Um, the first part of it is in the military domain. We've discussed the fact that Russia has demonstrated its ability to try to cleave off part of NATO's eastern flank without the alliance being able to respond in time. So the clear military charge to NATO has been improving readiness. NATO has um, come up with a 430s plan that aims to try to improve the state of alliance readiness, but really a lot of the improvements to military readiness have to come from our allies in Europe. Um, and that's going to take a fair amount of doing over the course of the next five years at least um, for them to be able to help mount that credible defense of NATO's eastern flank. Um, and a, a decent increases in military spending to which many of them have already committed. Uh, the second part of this is part of what we have been discussing in the competitive coercion realm. That is NATO, like most American alliance, is essentially still focused on military challenges. But it's ultra clear um, that NATO has an increasing remit in cyberspace. Um, and when it comes to activities like election interference. So this is an area in which I think the Alliance has a lot of institution building to do. Um, it can take a page out of the book of sort of first movers like Estonia, um, who has distinguished itself as really excellent um, on cyber policy and taking the initiative towards uh, crafting some of these new institutions. But if NATO stays exclusively focused on the high-end military threat, it's likely to risk, miss some of Russia's sort of biggest uh, rejoiners to the alliance that aim to split it and therefore to be in complete disarray. Um, so a new agenda for NATO will definitely involve institution building to combat cyber threats, um, disinformation, and other coercive areas. Finally, just last year, NATO identified for the first time China as a challenge for the alliance. And I think we should be modest about what we can expect our European allies to reasonably do in Asia because they have quite a lot on their hands in Europe alone. Nevertheless, it's uh, worth trying to harness some of this interest and identifying areas where European allies are increasingly concerned about some of China's activities and trying to get them involved there. One area I'd point to where NATO allies might be increasingly involved is uh, on initiatives to investigate the national security implications of new technologies, as in China's 5G networks. Um, so I'd like to see NATO increasingly cooperating with Asian allies through working groups that share information about national security risks that come from technology. 
Second, European allies are increasingly concerned about China's Belt and Road Initiative, which has landed itself inside of Europe um, in several different uh, European and NATO countries. Um, so both investigating the implications of China's infrastructure investment and responding uh, with alternatives of uh, European design or Japanese or Australian design is likely to be an area of increasing interest to NATO as well. So this is all to say um, that we've got a high-end military agenda, a competitive coercion agenda, and a China, if modest, focused agenda that gives NATO quite a lot of reason to persist for a very long time to come. No, no, no doubt, indeed. Um, and I think you're starting to allude a bit to the kind of opportunity costs of NATO focusing too much on China. I mean, this is something I wrestle with a lot from Washington's perspective. Um, ultimately, it would seem to me I'd rather NATO worry about issues related to Russia, but I do recognize China is the issue in the international landscape. So you, you can't expect NATO to ignore it. So I, I appreciate your perspective on, on kind of how to walk and chew gum. Um, you know, mo modest, I think, is the word you used, and that seems like an ideal description. Um, so in four minutes left, I want to try to throw a couple, couple things out at you. Um, first of all, you've got a number of really good questions about the public narrative. Um, a, couple, a couple of folks, Thomas Pledger has this really interesting analogy saying, is this a little bit like the successes of vaccination campaigns? Mm -hmm. You know, the, the public doesn't really remember um, what, what, what kind of uh, bad looks like. Um, you've got an incoming student, Daniel Alden, who's saying, you know, how do we demonstrate their value and success um, to, the, to, the, to the general public? You know, how do we, how do we kind of convince them of that? Um, you've got Christopher Doherty, who's worrying about just uh, alliances being seen as a partisan issue in particular. Uh, so curious to hear your thoughts on the public narrative. And then in our last moment or so, uh, I'd like to throw just a gut punchy question. Sounds great. Okay, I'll be brief. Um, so on this question of the public narrative, and this is a great uh, comparison to the vaccination campaign. I love that. Um, I would take us back to the idea that alliances work. Now, I had to write a whole book to explain that alliances work. So this isn't so easy to signal to the public. Right? Um, I do think it's possible, however, to hold up examples of places uh, where wars might have started and didn't, um, or where American allies clearly came to the United States aid. The best example I know of is as follows. Not only has no US ally ever been the victim of attack, causing the United States to come to its aid, the only time and Article 5, that is a mutual security commitment that is part of one of our security treaties, has ever been invoked was after September 11th when the United States was attacked and its allies clamored to its aid. So quite to the contrary of scholarly narratives that worry about entrapment and abandonment or public narratives that think that our allies are freeloaders, this September 11th moment is the clear moment that so many citizens will remember when the United States had more help and more support than it ever could have expected, if not for the system. So I think that example remains incredibly powerful and has a lot of contemporary resonance. When it comes to the question of political polarization and alliances, it's an interesting picture. Both political parties and the American public, identifying with both political parties, actually remain wildly supportive of alliances. And in fact, their support has only grown. The exception to that is that folks who self-identify as members of the president's base are much more likely to see alliances negatively and to see NATO negatively. So this should tell us that it is actually possible to craft a so, some realm of bipartisan narrative about alliances that could theoretically endure despite how many aspects of our foreign policy are so deeply politically polarized. Of course, if President Trump were not in the White House, it's possible that this support would even go higher because we can uh, think about this detraction as really being a measure of partisanship as opposed to a view of NATO specifically. So I'm actually hopeful um, on the public opinion front. That is, is great to hear. So in 30 seconds, um, there's a gut-punchy question by Daniel Gagliano, a recent grad. Can a liberal world order survive without America at the center of an international alliance system? And I'd, I'd ask for your answer to this question that deserves probably three hours in a sentence or so, and then we will thank you and sign off. The liberal international order that the United States helped to craft after 1945 will not survive in the form that it took for the last 70 years. Too much has already changed 
about geopolitics for the United States to possibly restore itself to its former leadership position. However, by renovating its alliances and crafting a new approach to the international order for the 21st century, the United States can actually remain a global leader and powerful by any reasonable measure for many decades to come. Is it possible for such a system to survive without the United States? Probably not. Um, but I hope we're not going to see this world. Instead, what I hope we're going to see is a United States crafting an entirely new grand strategy for itself to navigate an entirely different landscape. And if it does, a remade American alliance system will be a part of that. Fantastic. On that optimistic note, uh, Dr. Mira Rapp-Hooper, thank you so much for joining us. Folks, if you haven't started reading Shields of the Republic, please go out and get it actually ordered from your local bookstore instead of going out. Uh, many thanks. Great to see you and all the best. Bye-bye. Thanks so much, everyone.